www.ncpsa.com in the investor section. As a reminder, our comments within this call may contain forward-looking statements. These statements are subject to various risk and uncertainties. These statements include expectations and assumptions regarding the company's future operations and financial performance, including the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Actual results could differ materially from those predicted in the forward-looking statements. Hyzon Motors Incorporated assumes no obligation to update them in the future as or if circumstances change. For more information, please refer to the risk, uncertainties, and other factors discussed in our SEC filings. Additional information concerning factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those discussed during today's conference call or in this morning's press release can be found in the company's definitive proxy statement. Filed with the SEC on June 21st, its registration statement filed on July 20th and other documents filed by the company from time to time. During this call, we also refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures, including EBITDA. More detailed information about these measures and a reconciliation to the nearest U.S. GAAP measures is contained in the press release issued this morning, which is available in the investors section of our website and was furnished on Form 8K with the SEC. And with that, I am pleased to turn the call over to Craig Knight. Thanks, Darla, and thank you to everyone for joining us this morning for our inaugural quarterly earnings call. Today marks the start of a new chapter for Hyzon as a public company. July was a busy month for us. We successfully completed the merger with Decarbonisation Plus Acquisition Corporation with 94.8% of the shares voted in favour of the merger with a meagre 7.4% of common shares being redeemed for cash. Following the vote, we completed our business combination, which resulted in a primary capital raise of $555 million for Hyzon prior to transaction expenses. This remarkable achievement of closing our transaction with such overwhelming support from DCRB shareholders was both a validation of our strategy and an investment in our future. We officially began trading under the ticker HYZN on July 19 on the NASDAQ. With over $500 million of cash on hand, we'll continue investing in our growth as we drive towards a future of net zero emissions. I'm excited for this next chapter and extremely proud of our entire team's tenacity and commitment to get us to this point. We face the future with a strong sense of obligation as a public company. Recapping our commercial status, we expanded our backlog under contract or MOU to $83 million with additional customer uptake in both Europe and Australia. I'm also very excited to announce we delivered two additional municipal service trucks in Europe just last week, making three heavy trucks delivered since the middle of July. These are the seed sales we have always talked about, which lead to much bigger things down the track. We announced just this morning in a separate press release we have signed an agreement with TTSI in California to trial our first Hyzon Class 8 fuel cell electric truck here in the United States, commencing in Q4 this year. It's fair to call this announcement the tip of the proverbial iceberg in relation to negotiations happening right here in the States, and we're extremely confident in the desire of US corporations and government agencies to move towards net zero emissions. This belief has been further validated by the actions being pursued by the Federal Administration to reduce vehicle emissions in the United States, and we're excited to be part of this pivotal moment in the US. We expect Hyzon to be an important contributor towards 2030 emissions reduction goals as they pertain to heavy vehicles. Hyzon has also announced several strategic partnerships to enhance our portfolio and further develop and deliver on our business model. Our latest investment of $2.5 million in Raven SR will allow us to secure negative carbon score hydrogen supply from up to 250 hubs. We remain committed to facilitating the build out of hydrogen production hubs across the US to enable the quick and easy adoption of hydrogen powered commercial vehicles operating in a back to base mode. Hyzon is also broadening our addressable market by targeting very high power 
on and off-road applications and very long distance heavy trucking, as illustrated through the recently announced partnership with Chart Industries relating to on-vehicle liquid hydrogen systems. As mentioned earlier, we expect that our cash on hand of over $500 million will enable us to advance our plans to ramp up our operations globally. We believe our manufacturing scale up in New York and Illinois remain on track to be fully operational in the first half of 2022 as we build out our capabilities to bring American made heavy vehicle fuel cell systems to the market, which we believe will allow us to be at the forefront as fuel cell electric commercial vehicles are adopted to meet increasingly aggressive transition plans. We believe the decarbonisation of commercial transportation is dependent on hydrogen powered electric propulsion. With that, I would like to turn the call over to Mark Gordon, our Chief Financial Officer, to comment on our quarterly financials. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, Craig. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our first earnings call. We finished the quarter with total operating expenses of $9.3 million and a net loss of $9.4 million, resulting in a net loss of $0.10 cents per share. Our second quarter operating expenses comprised of $3.5 million in R&D and $5.8 million in SG&A expenses, which were both significantly below the internal plan as we prioritized cost control with the merger closing two months later than originally expected. Paizan also reported EBITDA of negative $9.1 million, significantly above our plan as we manage costs and focused on business drivers to execute on our commitments. Heisen management comes to the public market with nearly a two-decade history of prudently managing costs, both operating and capital, on behalf of our shareholders. We intend to continue this tradition and we expect to reach free cash flow by 2024 without needing to sell additional equity. Our asset light business requires substantially less capital than some of our peers and we are grateful to have a fully funded business model. As Craig mentioned earlier, we have cash on hand in excess of $500 million and no debt. The cash will be deployed to scale up our operations globally and build out our teams as we, as we remain on track to reach our forecast of 85 vehicles shipped by the end of 2021. We look forward to achieving our goals and anticipate recording our first revenues in the third quarter. In the last six months, our backlog under contract or MOU has grown from $40 million to $83 million, and we fully expect it to grow further. We believe the momentum to, towards hydrogen continues to accelerate and that we are, are fortunate to be in a leadership position. The first Hyzon development vehicles built with U.S. sourced vehicle chassis are currently under test and the first Class 8 demo trucks are slated for trial in Q4 uh, to, to North American customers. The feedback from early customer deployments in Europe and professional driver engagement in the U.S. has been excellent. Three points of note. First. The driving experience for truckers is a large improvement over diesel, with the vehicle providing a silent ride and superior acceleration. Second, we are well on the way to reaching total cost of ownership parity with diesel, and in the state of California and in Europe, with the various subsidies and escalating cost of diesel, we believe we are there now. And finally, our fuel cell electric heavy vehicles are green with the only emission being water. The Biden administration's focus on the transition to electric vehicles is a positive development for the United States and we intend to be a leader in this transition with our hydrogen powered fuel cell electric vehicles. Our investment in Raven SR will enable us to create hydrogen from municipal waste with minimal to no dependence on the electric grid as well as uh, with natural gas prices and coal prices making new highs as we speak, we believe 
an energy tra transition solution which is not dependent on the already strained electric grid will become increasingly important globally. Over time, we believe the market will recognize the unique solution Heisen brings to decarbonization. Our equity now trades at just three times the cash we raised in our SPAC merger. We are committed to controlling our cash spend and anticipate delivering free cash flow in just a few years. Over time, we believe the investor universe will recognize and reward us with superior relative and absolute stock performance. We believe our stock's recent downward movement is completely unwarranted and Hyzon is significantly undervalued compared with peers. I encourage you to look at the video posted to our website this morning to see the Class 8 truck pulling a trailer in upstate New York. We are excited to be a leader and first mover in zero emission heavy duty commercial vehicles. Now I'll turn it over to Craig for some closing remarks. Thank you, Mark. So while the past year has been transformational for Hyzon, and we're excited to further build out our global management, technology, development, and operation teams. I'll provide an update on some recent hires. We recently appointed Parker Meeks, a former McKinsey partner and seasoned energy professional as Chief Strategy Officer to lead our hydrogen supply strategy. We also appointed Shinichi Hirano with over 30 years of experience in automotive fuel cell technology as Chief Engineer. In addition, we have added seasoned professionals in both Europe and Australia as those markets are moving at a rapid pace and we need strong local teams to catch those waves. I'm very confident in our teams who are instrumental in achieving and delivering on Hyzon's plan as we collectively have hundreds of years of experience in hydrogen fuel cell technology and heavy automotive. Hyzon's technology positions us to be a first mover in net zero emissions commercial transportation. We are committed to enabling our customers to achieve their sustainability goals and drive towards a cleaner future with vehicles on the road today. And anticipated shipments in four continents scheduled to take place by the end of the year. That's this year. As laid out, Hyzon has much to execute on, several impactful events yet to come in 2021, and we remain committed to our 2021 sales outlook and shipping 85 vehicles by the end of the year, or more, while proactively dealing with the challenging global supply chain issues and COVID-19 resurgences with the Delta variant increasing around the world. Thank you all for being part of our continued success and we look forward to continuing our nearly 20 year journey to decarbonize the commercial transport industry. We appreciate your support and attention. With that operator, we can open the call up to questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound or hash key. Your first question comes from the line of Rob Wertheimer from Milius Research. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Rob. Um, so I had a question first on supply chain, which you just touched on, Craig. Um, 85 trucks this year. Do you have line of sight on, you know, on acquiring the chassis and, and you know, what is the, the, the risk points that you see around that, whether, you know, for your own sort of technology, technology solutions and or the, the actual trucks that, you know, that come in? Sure. Um, obviously, uh, no call at the moment with anyone manufacturing anything would be complete without some questions on supply chain. Challenges, um, they're not, they're not insignificant. Uh, however, some of these challenges started to emerge, you know, earlier in the year. And, uh, we started taking proactive steps to, to order chassis, parts, components, sub-assemblies, uh, earlier than planned. Um, so at the moment we believe that the shipment of at least 85 vehicles is not uh, a great risk for us because of inventories we've already secured and deliveries that to us from our vendor, vendors that are expected to take place over the next month or two, given very early order confirmation. Most of the order, most of the work in progress orders go back to uh, around April for
for us. Um, we didn't wait until the transaction closed to to deal with um, sourcing inventory. We were we were getting ahead of that curve uh, in Q2, early Q2. Okay, perfect. And, and if I can ask you another one, uh, obviously we all watch the orders and MOUs that come in through the quarter. I, I'm curious if you can just characterize what your conversations with customers are like. We've seen, you know, on the battery electric side, I think there's some, you know, maybe some limitations or just some specific, um, you know, builds that need to be made to handle the duty cycle of a specific order. Um, maybe that leads to some real test orders and people just feeling things out. Uh, I, I guess, if, are your customers just purely curious about hydrogen or are they looking um, you know, to do a test order and actually really follow it on with something that they're looking for something that really can can um, um, to, can scale in the next year or two. And then just um, your thoughts on um, where you're competing well against battery electric. And I will stop there and get back in line. Thank you. <laughs> no problem, Rob. Um, obviously, the comparison with battery electric is an important one uh, because ultimately this transition from fossil fuels to you know electrified non-fossil fuel vehicles is, is a great challenge uh, for everybody. Uh, with the billions of fossil fuel uh, vehicles around the world, um, we do believe that the world and fleet operators need uh, every possible you know, successful uh, or, or capable solution to be part of the, the future um, vehicle systems. So we definitely believe that there is a place for for battery electric vehicles um, in you know the future vehicle landscape. However, it's our view that all of the high utilization commercial vehicles uh, will move to hydrogen, um, starting with the heaviest high utilization payload imperative type scenarios. And then as hydrogen is more available and provides a very affordable um, driven mile cost on, on commercial vehicles, um, the lighter vehicles will gradually shift to hydrogen as well. So our thesis is that while we target the really low hanging fruit in the near term, those very heavy high utilization vehicle scenarios operating in back to base modes, we target them first. What we do by penetrating those segments is we make adjacent and additional vehicle segments much more attractive by essentially underwriting the adoption of the, of the uh, infrastructure. So we believe that um, we'll progressively penetrate more and more of the um, vehicle uh, applications. And to your question about whether or not you need very specific uh, vehicle um, specifications kind of customization on a kind of use case by use case, it's a little different for hydrogen fuel cell electric uh, vehicles simply because they function a bit more like a traditional vehicle. The power is determined by the fuel cell uh, working with the battery and the electric motor and the range is determined by the amount of energy stored in the vehicle which is a simple function of the fuel tank. So therefore the way we design and deliver vehicles um, is not quite as specific as the way that the battery electric vehicles might be designed and delivered really specifically for the customer use case because carrying extra range capacity on a battery electric vehicle adds a lot of extra weight and makes the whole operation less efficient. Okay, thank you. And I guess, so you don't, the entitlement of hydrogen as it looks like right now in the market, is that limited to freight hauling? I know I know you, you've, you've um, had a refuse uh, announcement. So, um, you, so that heavy duty cycle, I guess some of us probably thought it was freight uh, a year or two ago when we thought about hydrogen. And it, it, I don't know what, how much you, you feel like it's freight versus a variety of duty cycles now, and I really will stop. Yeah. So um, for us, Rob, it's all about availability to, of hydrogen in the near term. So you asked about customer adoption. Sorry, I didn't answer that well. Um, many customers are getting their hands on their first fuel cell vehicles, the first fuel cell vehicles they've ever seen here in the next six to 12 months. Um, that is a genuine kind of technology validation process, um, and the customers need to feel comfortable the vehicles function well in their use case. Um, in terms of the, the nature of the use cases, um, freight haulage uh, long distance is not really a target for us right at the moment because that opens up a greater challenge for hydrogen availability. Back to base operations such as concrete trucks, refuse trucks, you know, urban transit buses, refrigerated food delivery trucks, 
lot of port drayage trucks, like for example, in this morning's uh, press release, we talked about the TTSI um, agreement. This is port drayage. This is very high utilization. It's, you wouldn't call it a general freight application because the trucks really don't leave the region. Um, but they run many, many hours of the day and they're typically quite heavy. Um, so it's a good application for hydrogen and we're not introducing the complication of having to find hydrogen stations across the country. And that's our typical focus area are those back to base type operations rather than general freight. Thank you. Your next question comes from Mike Shulsky of the AD Hudson. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, hey guys, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Hello. All right, great. Um, I, I wanted to ask first about the TTSI order, very exciting stuff. Um, now, uh, they have placed at least one other large order with, a, with one competitor uh, already for both fuel cell and battery trucks. Now, of course, those other folks won't be delivering their, their, their fuel cell trucks for quite some time. Um, but I'm curious as to what is um, their strategy over at TTSI. Are they looking to pit people against each other? Could they come out with a mixed fleet of different uh, fuel cell trucks when all is said and done, you think? And what is the potential size range maybe over the next couple of years, you think, that they might, what, what percent might end up going um, battery or uh, fuel cell here? So specifically about TTSI and port drainage, right, Mike? Exactly. Right. Sorry, your sound wasn't great, so I was uh, listening hard to try, <laughs> try and follow. But um, on the TTSI um, situation in particular, TTSI is one of um, several companies serving the um, Port Drage, the LA Long Beach area of Port Drage uh, application. These trucks, you know, run many hours of the day. Typical uh, is two driver shifts every day, so somewhere around um, 18 to 20 hours of driving each day. And um, basically, TTSI is is of the view that to shift those, you know, two driver shift a day truck operations off diesel, they really need hydrogen. They don't anticipate that battery electric vehicles will get them there. Now there could be some there could be some operations um, that can be done with battery electric vehicles within the context of the TTSI business model. I just know that for their highly productive trucks, they're two driver shifts a day and they are very, very busy indeed. So in our view, those are the types of applications that are a natural for hydrogen. And TTSI's ambition is to understand all of the technology choices and they have been an earlier adopter of, of fuel cell technology, of natural gas technology, of battery technology, all of these various technologies because uh, especially being based in California and in an area with a strong mandate on, on air pollution abatement, um, TTSI has been very proactive in, in evaluating all of these various options to reduce uh, local air emissions in particular and now obviously carbon footprint as well. Um, in our view, um, the fuel cell electric trucks will prove this use case very handsomely compared to any battery electric alternative. And the trial will start in Q4 this year with TTSI and only they know what the future of that looks like in terms of uptake, but with, with over 13,000 trucks going in and out of the, um, the LA Long Beach ports with drayage every single week, um, we do believe that this is a natural application and a fantastic future, near future ecosystem for hydrogen. Uh, got it. Thank you. And speaking of uh, California, uh, we had a big day yesterday over there with the uh, with the voucher and subsidy releases. Uh, can you update us on whether or how far along you are in getting your truck approved for subsidies in California? Yeah, that's a fair question. So um, the there is a certification process. You know, we need to be uh, need to have CARB certified vehicles for um, for subsidy to be able to claim subsidies. This is a process. Um, it does generally involve uh, getting some outside help, some professional help. Um, so we've taken those steps. We have an engineering team working with consultants on this process. Um, it's not overly daunting. It's just a process, and it requires documentation, requires back and forth. And it's a typical process that, um, you know, could take somewhere between six to 12 months. Um, it's already been started. So when exactly will it be complete? I can't tell you because I don't kind of control the outcomes of the process, but it's definitely underway and it will be no more than, you know, I wouldn't think six to nine months away. 
he hoped to be uh, on the list for next year's vouchers? We do expect to be approved, yeah, in 2022, yes. Excellent. Um, can you also give us some sense, um, now that you've gotten your funding from the merger, um, what the go-forward cash burn might be on either a monthly or, or on a quarterly basis? Okay. Mark, I might hand over to you on the finance question. I will just say that, um, as Mark uh, mentioned uh, in the introductory comments, uh, we are very focused on managing costs. We are also very focused on earning reasonable margins. We are very focused on ensuring that all of the work we do earns a decent gross margin because it's only through decent gross margins sustained in the business from day one that you'll have a sustainable business. And we will never stand here and talk to you about growing revenue without margins. Uh, Mark, do you want to talk about our, our spend rates? Sure. I'm just going to follow up on your margin uh, point uh, uh, first, Craig. Um, uh, just because I think it's important and I want everyone to understand this. When you look at how we've guided for margins, you can see that uh, our gross margin floats uh, around 30%. I mean, it might be lower in a quarter because of shift, uh, mixed shift in sales in the business, but around there. And uh, we start off with a very high gross margin, and that's because our price point initially of the trucks is higher than you might anticipate because uh, customers are willing to pay up for the trucks to get them now, but we anticipate the ASP falling uh, dramatically uh, over time, and, and we anticipate fixed cost leverage in the business. That's why we have uh, the gross margin starting high and staying high. Um, now, uh, looking, looking forward, uh, uh, as Craig did point out, we, we are very proud of our results uh, uh, um, th this quarter. We were substantially ahead of our internal plan in terms of costs. And uh, uh, we um, anticipate a, a, a really uh, modest cash burn going forward. Um, so uh, for the rest of this year, we think it's going to be order of magnitude uh, l less than $50 million. Uh, is that for the whole six months, for the whole last six months? Yeah, months? correct. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'll give someone else a chance. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you, Mark. Once again, to ask a question, please press par 1 on your telephone. Your next question comes from Stephen Fox of Fox Advisors. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, a couple of questions for me, if I could. First of all, Craig, um, the company has highlighted a bunch of road tests and seed sales. I don't know if there's a uh, sort of a, a way to put a rule of thumb around how long those usually take before they turn into, you know, more volume orders and whether that's changing with sort of the landscape. But that was sort of the first question I had and then I had a follow-up. Okay. So I wish there was a simple rule of thumb. <laughs> um, it, there's not. Um, what we're seeing, though, is a, a clear pattern emerge uh, in Europe in particular where the availability of hydrogen is at a totally different level to what it is in the U.S., um, we're now seeing um, the pattern of adoption change quite a bit. So we've had some pretty interesting um, commercial anecdotes pop up in the last uh, month or so, whereby um, you know doing a, a deal and, and supplying a truck to a to a certain customer generates a, a, a lot of FOMO with with either competitors or or similar government, for example, agencies and. Um, it's it's very interesting to see the rate of the rate of uh, inquiry from from competitors, but sometimes it's not just the fear of missing out. Um, sometimes it's genuine uh, competitive issues. So we're seeing uh, companies in in Europe start to use their um, decarbonisation efforts as commercial credentials in various ways. So um, um, infrastructure contractors can qualify for bonus points on on tenders and this sort of thing, um, thereby improving their competitiveness by buying our vehicles. So I do actually think that our earlier assumptions around technology evaluation from those early seed sales through to kind of a fleet conversion type of um, buying, I do believe that those processes are compressing. So whereas earlier I would have said it's kind of a 12 to 18 month process to go from getting your first fuel cell truck and trying it out and then maybe getting a few more and figuring out what fleet conversion will look like over time 
and then kicking off that kind of fleet conversion process, I actually think that's compressing. Um, it's certainly compressing in a market like Europe. I think it's probably still valid in, for example, in the US. So I think 12 to 18 months from seed sales to a reasonable level of fleet substitution is probably a realistic um, time frame. Thanks for that. That's really helpful. And then just as a follow-up, kind of a related question. In terms of the capacity expansion plans in the U.S., how far ahead do you have to get with capacity in order to ensure, you know, the volume sales? And if you could maybe just weave in um, sort of an update on the Gen 3 Titan stack for next year and how that plays into what you're planning to add in terms of capacity, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So in terms of uh, manufacturing, um, I've always said there are three kind of determinants to capacity to get vehicles in the customer's hands. The first is our own manufacturing capacity of fuel cells and systems. Um, and systems include things like hydrogen subsystems, for example, and some of the powertrain systems. Um, that's, a, that's one determinant of capacity. A second determinant is the external supply chains. And at the moment, that second category of kind of capacity factors has been the major, you know, factor for manufacturers around the world for, for their ability to serve their customers' needs. Um, it hasn't been unique to us that it's been a challenge. It's been the case for everybody. Um, typically, we don't expect the external supply chains to restrict us like that longer term. But then there's a third determinant to capacity, which is vehicle assembly. And that's where our, you know, relatively asset-like model of using third-party assembly in the US, we use Fontaine Modification. That's a group owned by Berkshire Hathaway that does custom uh, building and upfitting of trucks. And they can assemble tens of thousands of heavy vehicles a year, plenty of capacity. Um, so that is not usually a capacity constraint in our you know, near to medium term outlook either. So therefore, um, if, you, if you consider those three kind of capacity factors, you would think that the, the most, you know, um, important capacity factor will be our internal manufacturing after the supply chain you know issues around the world are resolved so in terms of fuel cell production capabilities we have experience the management team and several of our core people have scaled fuel cell production into the tens of thousands of units a year type of scale uh, already through the parent company's activities horizon fuel cell so that's very useful know-how experience um, and real world experience in scaling that production capacity that's that's, you can't underestimate the, the value of that experience. And then there are, there are other you know, vehicle subsystems which scale without too much complication, like scaling the assembly of hydrogen subsystems and the like. This is not complex. Um, so we feel good about our ability to meet the, the growing uh, order book. So um, feeling very confident about our, our ability to meet the capacity here in the next you know, two to three years. After that, it starts to get more interesting because the scale of the business really gets to the point where you can start to constrain some of the some of the partners, for example, but we'll deal with that a couple of years down the track. Um, you asked about uh, technology development, specifically the next generation fuel cell stacks. Um, we are in the process of validating next generation fuel cell technology with um, one or two select customers in one, in one or two specific areas. It's not yet being pushed into the standard truck offering. What, we're, what we are offering in the market is a mature, proven fuel cell design, which is our Gen 2 truck stack, which, are, which I think you're familiar with, which has been proven with trucks in Asia and Europe already. And we see no risk to increase the risk of delivering vehicles, working reliable vehicles to customers we see no point to increase that risk, looking for some of the technology and performance advantages of going to the next generation stacks until we are absolutely certain that that everything has been validated, you know, to the very demanding requirements of commercial vehicles. So it's not only about the power you get from the vehicles, it's very much about the reliability. So we plan to keep uh, using our Gen 2 stacks until thorough validation is done on the next generation stacks probably at least into into like the end of 2022, early 2023, we would have, you know, some, I think the option to uh, start looking at specific truck use cases that could use that next generation stack. Great, that's all very helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stephen. Your next question comes from Mike Schilke from the, the A. Davidson. Please go ahead. 
Yeah. Mark's back. All right. Yes, I'm back. Thanks for taking my follow-up. I had one more I wanted to ask. Um, Mark, your comments about some of the first customers who have just received their vehicles this month, they, they seem pleased with the way it drives. I was just curious if you can give us any kind of technical um, uh, feedback as well. Are they getting a lot of check engine lights? Do they have to send people to, to, go, to go fix them at the early stage? Or are people able to get in, sit down, turn it on, and go without much of an issue in the early stages here? So, um, I'm, as I said before, your line's not great, Mike, but you were asking about exper user experience from the early customers? No I'm, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I was just following up. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah, I was just following up on Mark's comments of how, how some of the um, initial drivers were pleased with the way that the truck drives. I was just curious if you can give us some technical thoughts as to whether, are they, are they seeing a lot of check engine lights or other kind of technical issues? or are they ah. Able to pretty much get in and go at this point without much of, you know, technicians from the from the home base in Rochester trying to walk them through. Right. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, we would love for every deployment of every vehicle to go smoothly without any issues, um, but the reality of the matter is, you know, with with engineering, you know, assemblies and all the rest of it, you, you, you sometimes do have um, challenges and, and problems to deal with, but you know this is this is a, a typical uh, engineered product kind of process. Naturally, we do quite a bit of validation of the subsystems in the vehicles, and then the full working vehicle itself. Um, one of the nice things about these types of vehicles is that they communicate with you a lot, so you don't tend to have many surprises from the vehicle. So, for example. While there could be something we can observe in the vehicle that requires attention, we'll usually be able to see that remotely from operating data as opposed to that leading to a situation where a driver has to go into a workshop and say it stopped working or it's making strange noises or it won't pull the trailer anymore. So the, the way that you, you, you're confronted with, um, you know, with, with system uh, problems, we'll call them problems if you like, or issues, uh, is quite different with these, you know, electric platforms. As everyone's familiar with, you know, electric vehicles are quite communicative. You can see what's going on in, in all the various parts of the system, and it's no different between a battery electric or a fuel cell electric. We can see what's going on in all the systems in the vehicle. So we believe one of the great, um, you know, um, benefits of going from diesel to, to electric systems generally is that is that you minimize unplanned time off the road. Um, we had a great anecdote from a commercial driver here in the last week or two that the diesel trucks are so noisy that you don't realize there's something wrong with the truck, some simple mechanical thing wrong with the truck, like something shaking loose or something to that effect. Because the truck itself makes so much noise, you don't hear it until it becomes a really big problem. So one of the drivers said, well, for sure, you'd know, you know, you'd basically know even if a tie down strap was loose on these kind of trucks because they make so little noise. You'd hear the strap flapping, you know. So it's really interesting when you, when you, when you listen to commercial drivers that have lived with driving trucks every day and they're familiar with the, the factors involved. Um, so we were told that not only, not only do we expect that electric drive has less, you know, unplanned outages and all the rest of it, but just the fact that even minor mechanical stuff in the vehicle will be detected a lot earlier before it ever became a major problem, unlike is the case with diesel when you're operating a really noisy vehicle. I just want to add a little color to the driver experience. Um, so we all know that our, our trucks have much better acceleration than diesel, but this is actually a, a safety uh, feature of the trucks in a way. I mean, imagine a Class 8 truck trying to pull into traffic they have a hard time doing it, and it's much easier to do it with a hydrogen truck. So uh, with that improved acceleration, the vehicle is actually safer and easier for the drivers to, to uh, um, drive. And then on the, 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 the noise that Craig... Uh, yeah, we've, had that, with, we've had that comment multiple times, yeah, about it being much easier to pull out of, an in, out of a driveway, much easier to merge. So it just improves the life of the driver. And then on, on, then on the, the noise of the vehicle, um, you know, a lot of truckers now complain that they can't listen to music, they can't, you know, talk on the phone, you know, hands-free talking, et cetera. But in our trucks, uh, you know, that's something that's really, um, you know, easy to do because it's completely silent. 
Um, even, even truckers, if there's two, two truckers and one's trying to sleep in a diesel truck, it's you know, very difficult to sleep because there's so much sound uh, or noise. And, and in our truck, uh, uh, you know, they, they, can, they can go to sleep. So, so really, um, not only are our trucks green, um, and not only do we believe they're, they're, they're cheaper you know, than diesel in, in certain jur jurisdictions already today, but um, from a driver's perspective, it's, it's much better. And as you know, we're having a shortage of drivers right now in the country. So we, we think that you know, drivers are really going to be uh, you know, excited to drive hydrogen trucks. And to, that, to Mark's point, the, some of the commercial drivers we've had come and drive vehicles recently to give us their feedback. Um, actually, not some. Every single driver says that it'll be much easier for trucking companies to attract drivers if this is the kind of truck they get to drive because it's so much easier and more pleasant than a diesel truck. That's great color, guys. I really appreciate that. I'll leave it clear. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Your next question comes from Noel Parks of Stohe Brothers. Please go ahead. Hey, Noel. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, just had a couple things. I wondered, um, could, uh, in, and apologies if you've touched on this already, but um, the hydrogen hub build-outs that um, you're in an agreement um, uh, with Raven on, uh, at this point, can you tell us a little bit more about the pace of the build-outs and maybe a little bit more about your commitment under the agreement? Um, in particular, I'm sort of wondering, looking ahead, if there's a point where uh, the, the involvement with with them uh, strategically, strategically maybe do some tailwinds uh, down the road? Okay. Um, sure. So, so first off, I'll say we, we, we closed that investment uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, we uh, invested alongside uh, um, a large major uh, oil company and a uh, large oil trading house. <laughs> so we have uh, real partners in the investment. and. Uh, the first two hubs are going to be in the Bay Area. Um, it hasn't yet been announced uh, where they are exactly, but we anticipate that announcement uh, in the next six weeks. Um, so you'll have a, a, a great idea um, of where they're coming. And uh, um, we think also that in the next uh, um, you know, six months or so, there'll be other hubs announced. Um, and as Raven scales up and uh, as we scale up, we're, we anticipate, you know, tens to of hubs, uh, you know, to, to hundreds of hubs, uh, you know, uh, uh, completed with them. And, and, and just in terms, terms of the, in terms of the first yeah, two hubs, yeah, okay. yeah, in terms of the first two hubs, we are um, funding uh, a large portion of the first two hubs, and uh, we haven't disclosed uh, the capital that we are um, um, spending. But uh, what we have disclosed is we've disclosed that over our plan over the next uh, uh, five years, we're going to spend uh, $150 million, uh on, on uh, uh, hubs and refueling stations. Um, I, I, what we're also anticipating with the, you know, Raven is we're anticipating uh, after the first couple of hubs that, the, that they will be uh, debt financed to a large extent because what you have is you have a hub and you have contract with vehicles, um, so you have recurring revenue. It's really a, a perfect uh, 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 thing to be financed by the by the debt markets. And each each hub will have a separate SPV, uh, non recourse to to the parent. Um, so we're we're excited uh, about this, and we think it's going to be a, you know a, a also an asset light um, approach. Noel, another comment uh, on this approach. Obviously, we've spoken a little about our hydrogen hubs and how we are very strong believers in the localizing force of hydrogen and therefore local hydrogen solutions for local vehicle requirements uh, is the best way to start this business and generate scale. And so we like to call each of those hubs, you know, very strong nodes of a future network. Uh, but you never build out a, you know, a a network that's poorly utilized has a poor you know return on investment you start with very strong hubs that offer really compelling investment returns because we're we're coupling that vehicle offtake 
um, in other words, a hydrogen demand center with the whole investment rationale for the hydrogen hub itself. And so um, it's really important that that people understand that every one of these hydrogen hub investments is highly viable right off the bat because the vehicle offtake can be secured with major fleet operators who have an extremely predictable use of fuel every single day. And I'm just going to amplify a point that I made in the prepared remarks. I mean, these, these hydrogen hubs, you know, this is waste to hydrogen. Uh, Raven can also do, you know, uh, flare gas or, you know, uh, biogas to hydrogen. But um, what's important, you know, from my, my perspective is really uh, this is a way to make hydrogen that's not uh, dependent upon the grid. And uh, one of the things that we're concerned about is we're concerned about power prices increasing, you know, globally. I mean, you can see it already in Europe. A number of countries are at all-time high power prices and with, uh, you know, coal and natural gas making uh, new highs, what, what that's going to do is it's going to cause power prices around the world to, to go up. And uh, if we, you know, transition as fast as we need to transition and we rely upon battery electric, well, that's going to put a huge strain on the grid and that's going to cause power prices to go higher, which are a regressive tax on, you know, consumers. Um, and, and so what's great about, you know, our strategy of waste to hydrogen is that we have a way of uh, facilitating the energy transition that does not strain the grid the way battery electric does. And so uh, uh, we, we think that we're going to be critical to the future of uh, uh, mobility, uh, not only because uh, hydrogen and fuel cells are the only solution for heavy duty vehicles, but uh, we also have a, a, a solution that uh, where the energy is, is coming in a, a different way than, all, than where, where it's coming for everyone else. Thanks a lot. Very interesting point. Um, and just uh, one other thing, I wanted to just circle back to the supply chain again. And I guess, um, do, do you have a sense? And I, I imagine it's not an easy thing to pin down. But do you, do you sort of envision a, a horizon, maybe kind of a worst case horizon, by which time, you, you know, we'll have turned the corner and essentially not really have uh, supply chain issues as a, you know, as a major wrinkle. Um, and I guess I'm also curious if, um, in general, there's a part of it, a particular component or a particular type of component that is sort of the most improved in availability since the, um, the issues began, and then maybe what, what components might be the most challenging still. So, so I'll let Craig answer the component stuff. No, but let me just make super, a point, that, which is that uh, the supply chain challenges are really driven by COVID. So, uh, you know, I don't think anyone dares predict when COVID's over, but that's the driver of it. And once that fixes itself, uh, I think the global supply chain will fix itself. Fair yeah, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be reluctant to make a global prediction about uh, the resolution of supply chain challenges. Um, what we've, you know, factored in is obviously longer lead times for everything like I think most manufacturers have had to, had to live with recently. Um, but there was a good question in there in terms of what's, um, what's kind of getting better and what's not. Um, so uh, frankly, um, batteries continue to be a substantial challenge and some of the power equipment continues to be a substantial challenge. We've started to get a little relief on some of the uh, some of the chassis supply in Europe, for example, that started to improve a little. Um, but but overall, um, we still have this issue that you can have a virtually complete truck that can't go anywhere. And we've had that specific example with a, a, a truck that was supposed to go out to demo before the end of Q2 in Europe, a particular truck with a particular spec um, that was sitting there waiting on a couple of relatively minor um, uh, power related components from, from third party vendors. And because it was a particular truck, we couldn't kind of, uh, we couldn't substitute for, for another part that we had in that case. So, um, certainly we've been caught with some, you know, challenges, you know, et cetera. Uh, I mean, it doesn't, ex doesn't affect our ability to get that truck out there this quarter, for example, it'll be out this quarter, but it wasn't out when planned. Um, and that's the kind of thing we've been, been living with, but, 
that's also why back in you know March and April when we started to see some of these challenges around delivery times getting pushed out, uh, we started ordering you know rapidly ordering uh, ahead of when we were planning to order, um, so that we could get hold of what we need to deliver on our 85 plus legal shipments this year. Great, thanks a lot. That's all for me. Thanks, Noel. Sorry, I'm not a I'm not the global supply chain guru to predict the uh, the the light at the end of the tunnel on all of the supply chain challenges. I really hope for for everybody that um, COVID you know is brought under control globally soon and that we can have a more normal life again. Is there any further questions at this time? I would like to hand the conference back to our speakers for any closing remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining our call, um, and uh, we look forward to uh, you know hosting you uh, uh, another call in three months. Um, Craig, do you have any last thoughts? Sure. Uh, I just want to say you know we're literally a, f a few weeks into this this uh, new journey as a public company, and we have obviously some some substantial ambitions. We believe we're well equipped to execute on our plan, and we view it as management's job to deal with the various challenges that get thrown in our way. So um, we'll do our very best to to continue delivering the plan. We're going to be making every um, you know every contingency and 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 pushing every everything that can be facilitated to to make sure we continue to meet meet plan. And let me just uh, uh, also add that. Uh, the ACT conference uh, is going to be in Long Beach at the end of this month, and uh, we're going to have a Class 8 hydrogen truck there for people to see. Um, it drives, it, uh, it's got a lot of power, it can go up hills, and uh, uh, we, we highly recommend that people come by and see our truck. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're open for business here in North America and all around the world. So. Uh, um, we, we look forward to, uh, uh, you know, accelerating the energy transition and demonstrating our vehicle, you know, on the road now. And let me also emphasize, I said this in opening remarks, that there's a great video uh, on our website that we put up this morning that shows our Class 8 truck pulling a trailer. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that's in upstate New York, and it's really worth uh, looking at. Thanks a lot. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.